TumbleTrack is having a 10% off sale on side station items, which includes their air floor. So if you guys need if you guys need your side station set up for all of your summer training, if you need an air floor in your living room, now is the time. Check out the sale tab on their website. Visit TumbleTrack at T-U-M-B-L-T-R-A-K, TumbleTrack.com, train smart. Remember, the show is PG-13, so you might hear a naughty word or two. Simone Biles is not the most decorated gymnast of all time. The beam is not four inches wide. Nadia was not the first perfect 10 at an Olympic Games. Clutch your Swarovski pearls, diamonds, crystals, <laughs> because <laughs> this is episode 610 for May 8th, 2023, and this is our update, our fifth installment of Gymnastics Mythbusters. Welcome to the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy. I'm Jessica, and I'm here with Spencer from the Balance Beep Situation. And let us begin with our fourth installment of Gymnastics Mythbusters. We've done three previous, um, and we are going to revisit some old myths to reinforce them so you can tell all your friends, <laughs> excuse me, that's not true, or yell at the TV. And we have some new information myths to bust for you. Um, you can listen to all three previous episodes, of course. They'll be linked in the show notes. But I feel like, you know, sometimes we get new listeners, you know, every new quad, we gain more people. And I feel like, you know, some people don't know all of these important facts, starting with... <laughs> Jessica was like, two things we need to... First of all, we have to start with nudity, and then we have to talk about periods. <laughs> so it's like, there might be some new people who haven't ter- heard me talk about nudity and periods. Right. So, Yeah. The important the thing. myth, I guess. So the fr- I guess the first myth you want to bust is there's never been like naked gymnastics in the modern era before. At a competition. At a competition. At a competition. Right. People never believe me, but yes, there was. The truth is, there was naked gymnastics at the 1974 NCAA Men's <laughs> Gymnastics Championships. So. Um, this is the story straight from Fred Turoff, who was a coach for like 40 years, uh, gave us this info. So Ted or Fred said, just before the meet started, a young man walked out on the floor with a stocking on his head, like old timey bank robbers. He got in the corner, raised his hand, did a round off flip flop back somersault and ran off the floor with policemen chasing him. I love that there were police on the floor in 1974 for NCAA championships. Like what was going to happen? I guess naked people is what was going to happen. Um, yeah. But Fred said, I mean, clearly they weren't like right there because he was able to do an entire tumbling pass and they didn't, you know, catch him yet. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Fred says he did this on a dare for a hundred bucks. This is how poor everyone is in college. Well, not anymore with NIL, but um, yeah. So Fred says, yeah, he ran behind the stands out into the parking lot where another friend of mine happened to be waiting for him in a van. Um, and the guy ran into the van. He shut the van as the police came up. My friend with the van um, said he just saw a naked guy run out of the parking lot. And of course, all the policemen were there. And when the streaker came into the gym to sit down in the stands with all his clothes on, of course, we all stood up and applauded him. A multi Oh, the 70s. <laughs> oh, the 70s. People were constantly running around public places naked in the 70s. Like it was a nonstop thing streakers that's what they did i guess this still happens in the in the uh the big sports the big uh the nfls and the soccers and whatnot so you guys nobody believed me because i read it in mm-hmm. someone's biography when i was like 10 and you thought and i made it, made it up, a but it's huge true. impression on you <laughs> it did it's <laughs> <laughs> <was> like <gasps> so yeah okay okay other myths but I love that you have now put this into the myth category that Jessica would like you to know that there was an active ceiling leak onto an apparatus during competition. Is this a myth or just like you want to talk about it again? I mean, we have to record this in the myths episode for posterity uh-huh. for years later yeah. when people like, 
the FIG would never allow gymnasts to do beam routines on an act a beam that was being leaked on actively. So um, we're going to look at uh, what happened. This is a you know if you're a visual listener and you're watching this, uh, you can look at a photograph by our own photographer Steve Cooper uh, of a volunteer wiping up the mats. Um, at the uh, Liverpool World Championships in 2022, this actually happened. And huh. then there's a video. We t- I asked the uh, the U.S. team about it, and they said in their uh, in their uh, interview that they literally saw the water falling in front of their faces as they were doing their routines. Um, and so, yeah, the truth is there was an active water leak onto an apparatus and uh, they never, nobody stopped the competition. Yeah, it didn't happen. And all the gymnasts talked about seeing it and talked about being like, and the US team was like, oh yeah, that happened for a second. And I totally, uh, I saw it in front of my face and was like, what is that? You know, and then they all nailed their routines and did amazing. So I guess practice for any scenario. Just in case you thought that was a myth from seven months ago. It was not a myth. It really happened. Yeah. Hello, you're welcome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. God, Jessica, are we going to talk about periods yet? Finally, I, I thought can't you would ask. I can't wait. So, you know, if you wanted to know about, like, dumb stuff that, like, is still left over from haters from the olden days, or maybe current coaches that have lots of safe sport, you know, complaints against them are still coaching. Um, yeah, the myth that gymnasts don't get their periods. That still is something that's going around. So um, according to the NIH, NHS, not the NIH, the NHS, uh, your period will start the when good your one, body- The British one. <laughs> yeah, the British one. I'm not going to cite us. Your periods will start when your body is ready. This is usually between ages 8 or and 17 or, important, two years after your first signs of puberty. So if you don't have your period after like two years after your boobs start growing, then you go to your doctor and you're like, hey, is something amiss? Like, do I maybe am I missing a uterus or am I overtraining? That is another thing. Am I under fueling my body? Like, am I not eating enough? Um, you never know. Do I have too much stress or have a hormone imbalance? Something like that. The missing uterus. Oh, God, I wish that would have happened to me. That would have been amazing. Keep the ovaries, take the uterus. That's what I say. But anywho, you guys, um, I also want to mention this because Allie Raisman talks about this specifically in her book, Fierce. Um, she says, on page 285 of the U.S. copy of Fierce, um, that uh, you, she talks about having her period, but her period was really light. And so she got a new medical provider and they were like, you know, we kn- your periods are regular, but we want them to be a real period. And if they're too light, then that's a problem. She was talking about how like she kept having real pain in her shins and she wanted it to go away. So uh, she talks about how she learned that you want your period because the hormones help with your bone density and recovery. And um, her person, her health person, told her to increase her carbs and fats. And as a result, she said in just three days, her, the pain in her shins went away that fast. Of course, she's an elite athlete. She's not a normal human being and all that stuff. But it's one of the things that helped her in her longevity and, you know, making it to another Olympics and being really successful without injuries. So bones need hormones, hormones, yay, periods help them. So there you go. Let's talk about height. Another one of our favorite myths that you have to be short in order to be successful in gymnastics. Yeah. What's the truth, Jessica? The truth is that we have uh, elite and NCAA champions who have come in all shapes and sizes, including, of course, rhombus, we have triangle, what? all shapes and sizes, rhombus, triangle, triangle, square, square, yes, cylinder, octagons, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you know, Horkina five five. We've always talked about her, but we have uh, the current Olympic bar champion from Belgium. Nina is mm-hmm. five seven, you guys. Bars, which is often cited as, you know, the one that's a big pain in the ass to do um, when you're tall. By so- Jessica. <laughs> it's cited as the event that's a big pain in the ass by Jessica. <laughs> that's right. Um, so the average height of NCAA all around champions since we first did this episode is uh five, four and a half. So that's yeah, it's a little taller than four foot ten, which was always the famous size that was cited mary lou and simone size 
Um, and the first gymnast ever to complete the gymnastics trifecta Olympic world NCAA cha- gold medals. If they gave gold medals in NCAA, which they should. Um, five foot seven inch tall Kyla Ross, everyone. Also, I want to talk about um, in this video of David Viserys from Hungary, you can see, because we can't leave out the men, obviously. Um, he's 32, still competing. He's six foot one and doing his full twisting laid out Kovach. So he's amazing. And watching him, you know, it takes a minute. You always know when he's about to go on high bar because they have to raise the bar. And then he does one of those funky old parquet dismounts where he dismounts. <laughs> <laughs> he dismounts by going over the high bar. So it almost looks like he's going to do a release. But then he goes, keeps going, passes mm-hmm. the high bar and lands on the ground. So you have that moment every time where you're like, oh, he's doing a release. Oh, he's going to fall. Oh, it was a dismount. Every single time, even when you know it's coming. Yes, exactly. Even when you watched him compete many, many years. Like thousands of times, and you're like, yes. oh, uh, oh, oh, it was a dismount. Oh, there it is. Um, okay, so what is the, like, we've talked about height over and over, and we're always trying to just prove mm-hmm. this myth, but what is, like, a yeah. sub-myth that's related to this that you see still persisting, that we need people listening to yell at their friends and family and the TV <laughs> when they hear okay, this? Okay, yeah. To, to yell at the TV throughout NCAA season, anytime. There is a gymnast who is like over 5'3, which is she has beautiful lines. Her height gives her beautiful lines. And then you're watching it and you're like, which one's that squiggly line? <laughs> that, <laughs> that crooked line? Which lines are you talking about? Um, so yeah, it's always like we always hear that tall means like gymnasts, you're not allowed, like you have to quit if you start getting too tall. You're not allowed to be too tall. But if you are taller, then that's the only time you could describe as beautiful. Like that you have the beautiful form and the beautiful lines because you're taller. Um and being shorter means you're, you know, the powerful one. Also not always true. Right. Exactly. Like let's talk about Simone, who's been the e-score champion every time she's won a world championship all around, except I would say not 2018 and Doha when the Doha Pearl right. sabotaged her life. When she was sabotaged by the Pearl. Also, I think Nina was the e-score all-around champion in 2019, I want to say. Mm, that might be. Yeah. I mean, and Simone also had... But was most her? of the time. Most yeah, of the time. Most of the time. Like, more than... Yeah. I would say, on average, she is the, the e-score winner. Um, so... She clearly has beautiful lines because she is not getting deducted on things like leaps, like some other people. I also wanted to talk about somebody like, um, in this video of Ashley Miles, um, Ashley Miles made the, uh, she's currently, she's a new NCAA coach right now. She's 5'7". She made a world team in 2001. Um, She is tall and extremely powerful, not short. She didn't have to be short to be powerful. She is tall and also powerful. Also, one of um, my favorite gymnasts to watch is um, Sari Morrison. I always want to say Sari, but I think it's Sari. Morrison. Sari, yeah. yeah, Sari, um, who went to LSU. She was a U.S. Um, elite, and she went to LSU, and she's five foot nine. Five foot nine did a fantastic, amazing uh opening pass on floor which was a double arabian um i just loved watching her and she did all the events she did vault she did bars she there was no event that she was too too tall to do she even got a 10 on one of her vaults which you know the when i think the things that i think that people don't realize also when you get taller like shannon miller talked about when she you know a a grown-ass woman who came back to an olympic games she talked about how she had more power when she was taller you literally have some more mass and that helps you with your power. Um, another person that I want to talk about um, in this video of Shadalov, Alexander mm. Shadalov, a big favorite of the gym internet. <laughs> a big favorite of this podcast. <laughs> big favorite of he is six foot one. He's from Israel. He is a bronze medalist on floor exercise from 2011, I think. And the thing about him is it did not stop him from uh, being super powerful as exhibited by his first pass on floor, which was a pike double double where he did the first two twists in the first flip. So he goes up in the air, double double full, and then pulls out a back pike after that. So 
Shadalov, Israel, shout out to you. So have we, you can be powerful and tall. You can be short and elegant. And, and mm-hmm. like s- saying lines. And you can be it, tall and have bad form. Right. <laughs> Terrible It form. is possible. <laughs> it's so possible. Um, you can be short and have no power whatsoever. Another myth busted. Done. We fixed it. Culturally, it's not a problem anymore. Culturally, it's We're not. never going to hear it again. We did We did it. I, I just feel like when people say, like, um, oh, she has beautiful lines, especially if they're talking about that on a TV broadcast, you need to say what lines mean, which is her joints are in line or his joints line up. That is what mm-hmm. you mean by lines. That is what it is. So, which is not something you're born with. It's so, no. that's a, that's a that's work. It yes. takes work to have good lines, and it includes your spine and your ribs and all of that stuff. So it should be explained every time if people talk about that. Okay, the biggest myth, you guys. Mm-hmm. I can't even with this. We have an illustration, yeah. or if you guys, um, if you're a visual listener, you can watch this. But I'm going to describe it. The myth is the beam is four inches wide. My God, how dare they? How dare they say such a thing? What is the beam actually? 10 centimeters. Right. 10 centimeters, which is just close under. Four inches. <laughs> four, it's very close, but it's under four inches. There's nothing wrong. You can just say it's 10 centimeters. You don't have to say it. So if you take but a ruler. Americans might burst into flames if you mention oh the metric God. system. That is you know, his, a historical science fact. So and if you don't want to say, an American is confronted with the metric system, they just scream, cover their ears, and run out of the room. It's just under the three quarter length area of a standard pencil. That's what it is. Under that. Um, oh, now, now you've painted a pen. Now I know exactly. <laughs> It's not four inches. What if you can't say centimeters, 10 centimeters? It's not, it's like you can just say it's under four inches. Just that takes the same amount of like oral energy, right? Like, I think- I'm still on it's the length of a, the width of a VHS tape, uh, as we were famously told during the 1996 yeah. Olympics. Which, yeah. That's it, and it's totally relevant and remains relevant. Yeah, everybody knows so, how big a VHS tape yeah. is. Okay. Are you ready for the next myth? This is a big one. I'm so ready. I'm so ready. Most gymnastics yep. fans don't even know that this is a, a bunch of hooey. Okay, <laughs> so um, let's talk about the first per- perfect 10. Yeah. The first perfect 10. Wasn't it gym- Nadia? It was not Nadia. It, the truth is that Nadia was the first female 10 in an Olympic Games, but a man got a 10 in the Olympics before Nadia did, way before. I don't even know if women were allowed to compete back then. So Albert Sagoon of France was in the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris, France, and he got a 10 on his compulsory vault. And I am referencing the research. Uh, this is known by, I remember when uh, Uncle Tim of gymnastics he told me about this along with Blythe Lawrence. And I was like, wait, what? Nadia is not the first perfect fr- 10. And both of them in unison said no. And I was like, what? But I, I was like, how do I not know this? Um, so yeah, this guy, he did his compulsory vault, which was done on side horse, not long horse back then. Cause that's when we didn't have the table. We had the horse. Um, yeah. And he got a ten- say It was done on a physical horse. <laughs> a live animal horse because it was 1924. I think this Olympics was outdoors, so at least it was slippery, if not moving like an actual horse. But the thing is, you could say like, oh, well, is it like a point system? Was it really a ten? Well, it was because the scoring explanation back then was it was a if it was a perfect execution, that was a ten. So it still counts. This like not every event had a max ten at that point. Compulsory vault did. Right. So, it, like, culturally, getting a 10 wasn't really a thing yet. It wasn't, like, this notion of, like, a 10. But he did score a perfect score of 10 on Compulsory Vault in 1924. Um, yeah. But also, you know, try being Nadia, and then maybe people will talk about it. Yeah. Um, like, I, this will come up later and stuff we're going to talk about. But I do want to mention, like, there used to be a lot more... Olympic events too, and you have to count all of those because those those were in the the rules. But yeah, just like Nadia, compulsory ten. 
that's what he did too. Good old Albert. Um, so when everybody says Nadia was the first time, you should say, say the first woman. Good old Albert in 1928. Compulsory vault. Has everybody got down what to scream at the TV? I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> and scream for Or you can gently tell them. That's a better way to do it. Be like, oh, I actually. Like I'm surprised Nellie Kim didn't hit this hard. On, I know. like, Nadia didn't actually get the first perfect 10, because I feel like that would reinforce her in her insides. Yes. <laughs> to ask her about that. Okay, so this one is very upsetting, Spencer. The yeah. myth that Shannon Miller has two skills in the code of points. Th- that there's such a thing as a Miller? Yeah. Yeah. So, currently, there is there are no Millers in the code of points. <gasps> there was, sadly, never a beam miller um not the fault of shannon's but she never got credit for the submitted skill uh her intended miller that we were told in many tv broadcasts was the miller um on beam the back handspring quarter immediate uh half pirouette because the way it was described when they submitted it was a hop half turn which she a doesn't hop. do a hop. oh which w- would have been awesome hop would have been great would have loved it, but she didn't do a hop. So they were like, uh, you submitted a skill that you didn't do. You just, as we're seeing now, visually, did a half pirouette on the beam. So yep. that was never the Miller. Um, she did have a bar skill at one point, um, which was a cast one and a half to finish in mix grip. But heaven forbid, it didn't end in a handstand. She cast to handstand and then did a one and a half kind of on the way down. And so modern women's technical committee was like, ah, it didn't end in the handstand. Boo! We have to remove it immediately. Uh, so that's not in the, in the code anymore. Other lies we were told that she did had the um, hop full on bars named mm-hmm. after herself, which she, that's Chuso. That's the Chuso beat now. Right. That's the thing. Chuso did it in 91. Miller did it later. Oh, you guys, so many lies. I mean, maybe we need to start a whole thing where we go through um, old broadcasts and correct them. <laughs> or current broadcasts. Oh, that's, a, that's a full-time job. That is a full-time <laughs> job. We don't have time for that. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Um, I the th- My question for you is, whose fault is this? Was it Petty L- Peggy Lydic or Steve Nuno? Who submitted the wrong <laughs> description of the skill can't, for Shannon? Can't it be everyone's fault? <laughs> Why does one person have to be at fault? Oh, fine. Um, All right. I want to talk about skills versus the code. Because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have referenced many times skills that were in the code that were then taken out. And, but like Shannon Miller's, like, they were never in in the first place. So I want to know what are the actual skills that were in the code and then disappeared or were given to the wrong people or what happened. And let's start yeah. mm-hmm. with beam. Start and end with beam. Cause it's like, it's our event. <laughs> it's only we're going to talk about probably. Um, okay. So I do have something that I think you will enjoy quite tremendously right now, which I'm calling the myth of the candle mount. Because he, famously, if you don't like, you know, take notes during every episode jessica does not care for the requirement or semi-requirement on the candle mount which is the back dive mount on beam that everyone does now um that you have to like be in handstand or that we're using the term candle even though gymnasts are not candles they're humans um it (laughs) just bothers jessica in many respects so it, nobody knows what that shape is outside of the sport it's a back dive everyone knows what a back backwards dive everybody knows what that is well i have some good news for you on this front okay so when the All skill right, i want to i want to see this when the skill Let's was see. originated ramona bukes 2007 worlds well i should say originated when it was named and entered into the code of points because every skill was done by someone else at some point but 2007 worlds the description of the skill as submitted at this point was from standing with back toward the beam, flick flack over the beam to land in front support. And I would say that's what she's doing here. Yeah. But you don't require that. There's no requirement for you to stop and show 
your this is ha- hands. This okay, is exactly what I'm saying. All right, tell me that the word candle, the word handstand appears nowhere in the skill. Exactly. Not she didn't submit that. She didn't per- tr- perform it. She didn't try to perform it. She didn't submit it. That's not how it was described. The word candle was not added to the description of this skill until the 2013 code update, six years after she performed it and got it named after herself and entered in the code. Then in the 2017 code update, they were moving things around and changing things and trying to fix things. They misattributed a different skill to Bukes. They just gave her a mount she never even did because the code and they make these mistakes all the time and they still misspelled Chelsea Memo. Um, They fixed that in 2022 and gave her back the skill she actually did. But now the description had the candle position requirement in it, which she never did or tried to do and wasn't her skill. So now the Bukes in the code of points is, you know, a back dive to candle position, even though that's not the skill. And they just added that later. It's not the skill she did. And there was, that's kind of like, that's not what the actual, that's not what the skill is. What I'm saying, I thought you would enjoy the story. I enjoy that story. Vindicate, vindicate your much. hatred of the candle requirement because it's fake, basically. Yes. Oh, my God. This is an excellent Mythbuster, Spencer. <laughs> like, I know. I that's mean, why I said, like, you started arguing. And, I know. And I was like, like, no, no. <laughs> you're going to love where I'm going with this. You're going to love it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I love that one. So, hmm. Okay. So, so what we're saying is every time I say, oh, she didn't really hit handstand or that candle mount and I want to deduct for it, you could be like, bah, 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 bah. you don't have to. You don't have to. That's not how it Because she done. never did it. That's right. I mean, it's kind of cool when people hold it and then they do a little pose. But if you just hold it and then go to front support, that's boring. And don't be boring. Mm. That's the most important thing. And also, if someone's going to yeah. do that mount and you have time to plan for it, like an NCAA championships where you know every single routine, show it from the side, not straight on. I mean, long ways. Mm. Show it long ways is a more interesting way to see it. Uh, and scarier if you watch it that way, which is important to get people to understand how terrifying it is to jump backwards. And that explains why gymnasts always look behind them to make sure the beam is still there because you never know. Okay. Next, the yeah. myth of the Anodi is one of the most upsetting myths Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. will this ever change that's what i'm gonna okay so what is the myth of the anodi and what is the truth the myth of the anodi is that is the word anodi is describing the skill as an anodi because olga mastopanova perhaps the greatest gymnast of all time performed this skill at worlds in 1983 and it's perfect and at that point in 1983 anodi was nine years old and even yeah. in the 80s, we didn't have people competing at nine in our worlds. At 10, at, at 12, at 11. Ten, maybe 10. Maybe yeah. a 10. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but yeah, so this was years and years before, six years before Anodi uh, performed it. Olga Mostopanova was doing it at worlds, nameable competition, and also, you know, doing it better than anyone else has ever done it, even to this day. Um, and we don't call it the Mostopanova, even though we should. And the other thing about it is she literally is doing it out of, she does a press handstand mount, split handstand pirouette, turn, step down, and then does her the anodi out of a series. She does a series. You know how hard it is? I mean, well, that's why we talk about it so much time because there are very few people who do an anodi in a series right now. There's a gymnast that does it in NCAA. It's so hard to do it like that. So not only was she doing it when anodi was still in grade school, uh, she was, she did it so well and in a series. So, oh, yeah. So are we going to start calling him Masta Panova? Are they going to get should try in the, yeah, I should I learn how should, to say I it with the right accent. On it. <laughs> okay. My next question for you, Jessica, what is the Lucan in women's artistic gymnastics? In women's it's when your dad yeah. does a triple back on floor. No, in women's artistic gymnastics. It is a front chicken dump to scale. A front toss, a front tuck that starts, let me describe this. You, It yeah. looks like it's going to be a front aerial on beam. But then fakey, you tuck, land on one leg, don't touch the other leg, and do an arabesque. It's not a scale. It's an arabesque. 
Uh, but it's not a skill. Was it ever a skill? I, your description is 100% accurate. And now I'm going to talk about what the, to, to reality. You just reflected reality. And now I'm going to talk about what the code says, which is not reality. Okay. So for a time, and this is sort of famously discussed, and this is the accurate part of it, which is taking it to scale for a time was the Lucan. And then shortly after, word, the Women's Technical Committee decided that going to scale or going to arabesque was an, another skill. That was its own, that was a separate thing, independent of the skill. But what ended up happening was, in 2008, the code described the Lucan as a front salto piked with takeoff from one foot to scale. Oh. Which I have a problem with because piked, piked? I don't no. see a pike. No. I never saw a pike. So that's weird. And then they got rid of the scale part because they said that's that's two separate elements that you're doing so now the lucan in women's artistic gymnastics is a salto forward tuck take off from one leg to stand on one leg or two so a kick over front um is named after nastia lucan she invented it you guys she was the first one to do it if you didn't know uh, that skill has been done for like 30 years <laughs> Before Nasa did it. That's so weird. Oh my God. We need, there's so many things that need to be fixed in the code, you guys. Ugh. Okay. So, yeah, the I next have, one. Yeah, I have another thing because. Featuring my favorite gymnast ever in the whole entire world. Right. In the code, as much as we criticize it and as much as many problems as there still are with the named skill section of the women's code, they're trying to fix it and they've made some rectifications and some improvements. Credit where credit is. So, yeah, it's getting better. It's like the theme of the podcast over the last couple of years. We still have 90,000 problems, but there are a couple things that are getting better. Um, there were a bunch of leaps, like turning split leaps on floor that were named after people. And then those names were mysteriously removed a couple decades ago. And But they're still popularly known by those names, like split leap one and a half on floor or tour jeté full on floor you'll often hear referred to as a Gojian, after Gina Gojian. Um, for a long time, her name was not in the code of points for that skill. Uh, but that was it was returned in the 2022 update. So Gojian got that skill back. Protonova got back the split leap full to sit split greatness, which it's in the code of points, people. It's there. It has a value. Do it. Please. Yes, please. Please. I mean, for your own health and safety, maybe don't do it. But for us, please do it. Um, <laughs> it's so cool. While, while those have been returned, Carrie Strug's split leap full or tour jeté half still is not called the Strug in the code of points, even though others have had their names returned. So I'm like, Carrie, complain. Carrie, you were in government. It's your time. Yeah. You know how to make a complaint. Get it done. Like, do all the paperwork. Carrie, get in touch. We can help you with this. Let's return. This is the other theme of this. G get in touch so we can help you fix the code because they are retroactively fixing things like you're talking about and it is happening. And I think that's such a great thing. So we should celebrate. We can have another Carrie Shrug day when that happens. I'm sure she has a day named after her somewhere, like in Arizona or something. <laughs> what we have to figure out is whether uh, there were like, there's evidence of other people at a world championships doing it before. But then still, that's its own inconsistency, because there are thousands of these skills, like the Anodi, where there is evidence of people doing them before, and they're still, you know, it's still the Anodi. True. All right. The, the greatest myth of all. Uh-huh. That the International Gymnastics Federation, the FIG, likes gymnastics. True or false? <laughs> oh, you silly goose. Um, no, we're going to bust, bust that myth, because there are a bunch of fun skills that are good gymnastics that were in the code of points that are not in the code of points anymore or are half in the code of points, but don't have a value like the Porta Carrera, which we should look at now for visual listeners, which I enjoy tremendously uh, kick over front to tuck sit with the leg extended, which pretty. is still in the named skill section but does not have a skill number or a value. Um, also for Yves Marie Poulain from Canada, who did the same thing, but from a front tuck, not a kickover front, gone completely. 
no evidence of her name at all in the code of points, which is, come on, let's bring it back. You know who could do this and it would be amazing is Ellie Black. Because yes. you know how she does her power lifting and has a quads and a butt of steel. And remember how that mm -hmm. time at like Pan Am Championships or Games or something, she did a front tuck, landed on a pinky toe, and did a sl very slow single leg squat and just stood right up and continued with her. I her do. Routine. It's my favorite thing she's ever done. But, you know, she's very uh -huh. good and nice and wins a lot of things too. But also, yeah, but this is the most important. But that's yeah. the most important thing quad and butt strength. So, I mean, think about her doing this skill. She could do it either way and she would land and slowly descend down into yeah. a sitting position not like you know qu like a butt sit. kind of fall it looks like an actual <laughs> like, kind, of fall. kind of almost fall but it's still really cool um yeah this is the next is this, should this be the next chelsea memo challenge yes show up, show up to national team camp and be like i'm gonna do this now all of you gymnasts that i'm selecting for teams you can do your basic ass beam routines and i'll just sit over here and be like <laughs> look what i just did <laughs> <laughs> oh my god chelsea is the other person she could probably do it on a high bar too but don't do it on the high bar <laughs> like you've done your other pistol squats please just do it on beam chelsea oh that'd be so cool and then you could transition if you must do an ugly ass wolf turn just half turn and then your wolf turn position oh my god i figured out everybody's wolf transition mm -hmm. that'd oh. be good okay. you're right there you're about this um, okay also know, i want to say yeah yeah I just want to say, topic. Larissa Libby, uh, our favorite Iowa head coach, who also fell into a plant, according to her teammate, uh, Stella Ume, at a competition that got hurt, and Stella had to help her out of the plant and into a taxi. She <laughs> told that story uh, on the, the uh. podcast. We could link to the episode. Uh, Larissa Libby, uh, she has also suffered injustice. Yes, she no. has suffered injustice at the hands of the women's technical committee because she has a mount name or had a mount uh, an eponymous mount on beam that was later combined with another skill from janine rankin which is an, its own excellent skill the rankin is the um like jump to one-armed hands like press handstand on beam, where you hop great. around in a circle that one <laughs> you, you just jump and then you're in it and it's excellent but it's completely different than larissa libby's skill which is um you know a press handstand lower it has one arm elements to it but we'll watch it right now if you're watching it's so the press handstand go to one arm in your angled split one arm hand and then lower yeah to a straddle and then sit completely different but it's combined in the code uh, with another mount, the Rankin, and then it's just named the Rankin. Why? I always thought that was named after, oh, she does a jump to handstand instead of the press to handstand on the end of the beam and then steps down. Totally different it skills. It's a totally different skill. They're in the same box. And the, well, it wouldn't be the Libby, it would be the Lowing, Larissa Lowing, her maiden name, um, is nowhere to be found. This is unacceptable. We also need this fixed. Although I do feel like somebody did this before both of them. Well, I'm sure. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the other I'm thing. Sure. Yeah. But, remember you the, know. the same gymnast <laughs> that did like her mount was a jump to a headstand with no hands balance. And she also did the jump around full. Uh, she did a one arm handstand and then jumped around in a circle. Uh and did like a pirouette, but it was all hopping on one hand. And basically, I feel like they were like, it, this is too circus. It's amazing, but too mm. circus. So we're going to skip it. But this is why a full head spin needs to be added, because that would fulfill the new requirements for a turn on beam. And so someone needs someone who doesn't care about having a lot of hair on their head or needs to mm. only practice it once a week needs to add the or wear a little situation on your head. One of those things like those... Um, the synchronized swimmers wear. They have those little head situations. Wear a little situation. On your head. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a tiny boop to keep your hair in place. That thing. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have to fix that. So, so far, it's not looking like the FIG likes gymnastics. What happened to... Because they keep um, removing all of the cool or vaguely interesting skills, like the Marty, which is another skill that I enjoy quite a bit on bars, which was a skill for a hot second, where you cast a handstand on the low bar and then do an immediate front salto to catch the high bar. I love that. 
It's so fun. It's such a cool skill. And honestly, it looks easier than a hecht. A hecht is definitely way harder than that. I'm not saying it has to be I super high it. value. Just like, let's see it. Yeah, that's at least a B. I'm good with C. Yeah, I mean, a C would be nice, but like, let's be honest. Maybe in level 10, they would do that. But What if you did it as a mount? Like run, approach, well, like Jun? low bar. Oh, that's cool. Get to, get to handstand and then almost like you're rebounding off the low bar. To so do you a jump, forward. jump to handstand, bounce off and do yeah. it. Then I can t- get a C. Yeah, I like that. What if you do it with then and you add a full twist like g- the Gabishian and then you can get a D, right? <laughs> yes. I like that because that is one of our favorite mounts. It's so cool. And then you kiss the high bar. Someone should do it again, get it named, and then kiss the bar. That's what everybody knows. This is very important. If you don't kiss the apparatus, it's bad luck. Okay. I want to get to something that I didn't remember was a myth until you put it in the notes. (laughs) Okay. So I'm going to say the myth. What is the myth? The myth as reinforced by the medal stand at the 2005 World Championships that Chelsea Mammel beat Nastia Lukin in the 2005 World Championships all around. Uh, because the standings say that Chelsea Mammel finished on a 37.824 and Nastia Lukin finished on a 37.823. In actuality, that was just a result of how the scores were displayed <gasps> on each apparatus because they truncate decimal places, my biggest pet peeve, at three decimal places. So they didn't show, they didn't don't display the whole score with all four, in this case, decimal places. And if you just added the whole scores, both gymnasts would have received a 37.825 and would have tied for the 2005 World all Around title, which is what they actually did. Their actual scores that they received tied. They just didn't display the full score. They stopped at three decimal places for each event score. So it ended up looking like Chelsea Memel was a thousandth of a point ahead of Nastia Lukin, even though she wasn't, they should have tied. (sighs) I mean, this is the thing about, you've talked about the, the problems with truncating a lot. Which we uh, just had in Oceanic Worlds. World Championship qualification. It happened again. Right. And how, I mean, are you surprised that no one has like taken action over this? Like that no one, like that Chelsea <laughs> Memel hasn't been like, hey, that's not fair. You're trunking. Well, I mean, it benefited Chelsea. So <laughs> why would yes. she? But yeah, like, well, the, I mean, the I feel Nostra like or- the, the Lucans have been frequently uh, the victims of dumb. FIG score rules. Yes. So, um, you know. The whole family. Yeah. I'm surprised that the Lucans have not taken action to get something done about this, because I feel like they could. Yeah. Or could have. Like, people would have listened. Yep. This is why it's so important to always have somebody actually following the real scores, either on the floor or in the stands, who can yell down or message someone on their phone watch since you're allowed to have your phone watches on like your apple watch and be like put in an inquiry before this changes because the score is truncated and you actually tied well that's not something you could inquire because this is just the rules of how they do it just the rules are bad threaten threaten (laughs) it's worse now because they do stupid dividing by three judges so we end up with your 0.333 repeating 0.666 repeating which is a disaster yeah this is not good. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we, that's another thing we need to change. Is this a Mythbusters or a How Sports Are Broken show? Well, I mean, I feel like every episode we do kind of devolves into <laughs> everything is broken and needs to change. Yeah, this is why I don't pay attention to scores and I just enjoy the gymnastics. That is really the You lesson. need someone to, otherwise we end up with like incorrect winners. Yes, that's true. That's right. Literally incorrect winners. Or a missing tie when there should have been a tie for crying out loud, the best thing ever. Ties. 2015 <laughs> Worlds, the best, 2017 oh, Worlds, God. the best bars finish of all time. When everybody figured out. The one you mean with what four, is, the was four it 2015 way tie. Scotland? Glasgow, the Glasgow, Glasgow. four way tie. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, okay. Okay. So, so Jessica, we talked about height. We talked about puberty, but I noticed that you have not talked about age yet. No. And we are going to talk about age in a moment. But before we do... We'll be right back after this. You might be interested in knowing that this show is brought to you by Club Gym Nerd. If you have not already, you can join Club Gym Nerd and get special bonuses like our extra podcast that we do on Fridays every single week where we tell stories from Jessica's life and then I react to them and I'm like, oh my God, what is wrong with you? Uh, You can listen to us do that. You can watch us do that. You get all of the bonus club content um, and you can add those behind the scenes to your favorite podcast player. Uh, You get exclusive extended interview bonus scene things when that happens, discounts on merchandise, discount on live show tickets, you can do a rage meter or a passion meter. Doesn't if you're not a mad person, if you're not full of anger in your inner soul like I am, you can just have a passion meter where you make Jessica yell about something you feel passionate about. She that you feel passionate about, and then you can have audio of Jessica yelling about it, even if she doesn't actually think that. And then you have that for blackmail purposes for the rest of time. It's excellent. So check out the support us tab at gymcastic.com to join the club. And we're back. Our first myth having to do with age is for female gymnasts, you've heard your friends say, or you're, <laughs> you're the boomers in your life. Their career is over. After high school, that's it. They can't do gymnastics anymore, right? Like they can't go to an Olympics or world championships. But I've watched college gymnastics, Jessica. <laughs> So let's talk about how many college gymnasts have made a world or Olympic teams or won medals or made finals in college or post college even. So we have some new people to add to this list and shout out mm-hmm. to college gym news who has a nice list up. It's not totally updated, but it's a great list. And now I don't have to keep one cause they do. So um, we're <laughs> looking at their website right now. So Skinner, after Utah went on to win a uh, Olympic vault medal and thank God that she did that and didn't go home afterwards. Um, also Mohini Bahardwaj post-college Olympic medalist in 2004, Kate Richardson from Canada also made the Olympic floor final. Shallon Olson most recently from Canada made an Olympic team. And then during college, a world team and won a medal for Canada. Uh, post-college recently, uh, Simona Castro from Chile, Corey Garbagian from Romania, who we already talked about, who then got an eponymous skill and kissed the bars and made all the news. She went to Iowa. Jessica Lopez from Venezuela um, went to Denver. Brittany Rogers was going back and forth from Georgia to Canada to do her trials at the same time, made that Olympic team. And then all the way back to Kelly Garrison, uh, Kelly Garrison Steves, Kelly Garrison Funderbook. Kelly Garrison went to Oklahoma, invented all the skills that involve some version of a Valdez sideways, full twisting on beam, full twisting beam mount and made the 88 Olympic team. So I think I rest my case. So this Mm -hmm. is the Mm -hmm. memorize this list and just shout it at people when they say they can't, you can't make an Olympic after high school. They can't do gymnastics anymore. Right. Or next year, because we're a year out from the Olympics, you guys, when we get the Olympic gymnastics articles and they say things like Olympic gymnastics, the domain of teenagers. And you're like, As, what, what are we, do you need some numbers sent to you? Because we've got them because that's not super right. Exactly. So let's talk about some of the longevity legends. And I know these are kind of outliers, but there's still a lot of gymnasts who are uh, competing in their late uh, late 20s, like Vasiliki mm-hmm. Malusi, Marta P. Um, and the longevity. So the myth is after you're like, you know, in high school, you can't do gymnastics. After college, you're definitely done. But let's mm-hmm. talk about the legend of Chusevitna, who since our last... Our last update of Mythbusters now has gone to eight Olympic Games. Eight. Eight Olympic Games. Uh, yeah, she last competed at age 46 at a World Cup. 
Um, or was that at that Olympic? She was 46. She's older now. Yeah. She's like 48 yeah. now. Um, so at the at Tokyo Olympics, when there's a big standing ovation and she retired and then she unretired five minutes later. But, um, according to the medal counts research, thank you for this. The oldest woman to compete in Olympic games before Chuso was in queen gymnastics, yeah. in gymnastics. Yeah. Not in all the sports, but in gymnastics, was like queen. those equestrians are like, Oh my yeah, God. Half in the grave. Right. Queenie Judd. 1928 Olympics. So they did have women in the 1920s doing gymnastics. Um, and she was 41. So that is, uh, yeah. So she just made the cut for the oldest at 41. And then of course we can't forget Jordan Yochev, uh, who famously at the end there from competed for Bulgaria only worked out for 45 minutes is what he said he did. He just got in, did his conditioning, did his routine, left the gym. Six consecutive Olympic games robbed on rings in Athens, as we all know, but great uh, rings worker, four Olympic medals, 13 world medals, all time hottest gray haired gymnast to ever compete. This is still a fact. <laughs> but still that's yep. Yep. Yes. Everybody knows that. So I want to do a tribute. Basically the rest of the show is going to be a tribute to uncle Tim, who is our, has been with the show. One of the original gymcastic hosts and has a PhD from a, I would call it a, uh, even though the Ivy League all has to be on An the East average, Coast. average, unfamous institution. Right. Yeah. Um, I have decided on a new name for him, um, which is, a, he's a forensic historian of gymnastics. Okay. Okay. I feel like that's really accurate, right? Like he is going one by one, essentially tackling these gymnastics myths and being like, well, this is the commonly held belief. Let's see if it's really true. Uh, let's find out. And he is uncovering amazing things. So let's talk with about uh, number one, Olga Corbett. The mm. Olga Corbett, the first myth about Olga Corbett, and we can watch a video of this, is that she was the first to do a back tuck on beam at an Olympic Games. But actually, the truth is, and we're watching this skill, Nancy Thies of the United States was the first to do a back tuck on beam because Nancy Thies of the U.S. at the Munich Olympics, she competed earlier. Corbett mm -hmm. competed a few hours later. So actually, Thies was the first to do it and not Olga Corbett. Olga Corbett had been doing the skill on beam for years, but we're saying Olympic Games and what was done first at Olympic Games. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, she didn't do it before Corbett, but at the Olympics. So the thing mm -hmm. about it is nowadays, people do the same skill at the same meet, then they both get things named after them. We're not talking about eponymous skills, but in general, uh, like right. uh, bars. The, uh, the Durwell Fenton. Durwell Fenton, thank you very much. Yes. Mm -hmm. And which is much more fair because you don't get to pick when you go in the lineup. So, right. Or should we attribute perfect tens that way too? Nellie Kim would say yes, since she got a perfect <laughs> ten. But Nellie Kim would say she does not agree with the multi naming because she gave the bet double tuck on floor to herself, and not all the other people who did it <laughs> on her same team in the same lineup <laughs> at the nineteen seventy six Olympics doing a double tuck. Oh, good times! Uh, so Corbett myth number two. And I want to yeah. take a look again at gymnastics hyphen history, which is uh, Dr. Uncle Tim PhD's Olympic uh, forensic history gymnastics website, which we hope he will be t turning into a book very soon. So Olympic myth number two, Corbett was the first to do a Corbett. So mm. this Uncle I did Tim not know. Yeah. This is, me new in this is new information to me. So the Corbett uh, Jessica is describing would be the swing down on beam or the splashdown if you're some people and that makes me uncomfortable as terminology i don't like it. the back handspring then you roll down on your chest onto your crotch fulfilling the perineum requirement on beam <laughs> so uh, according to uncle tim dr uncle tim's research um he found that a, a record in modern gymnast magazine that someone did a corbett at the 1968 olympics but they don't name the gymnast 1968. So if you are the gymnast who was mysteriously mentioned in Modern Gymnast Magazine and you're listening to this, or you know who it is, then get in touch. We can help you get it named after yourself and get history corrected because this is 
part of what the FIG is actually doing now. They are wanting to correct and name things after the right people. And so you can actually have it done. Mm. So who it's do you think open it was? this skill used to be the core bit in the code of points, and it's not anymore. Which would also make me think that someone tipped off the FIG and was like, she wasn't the first person to do this, but we still don't know who it was. It was probably Mostapanova who traveled back in time and was <laughs> negative seven fetuses <laughs> and was doing it already. <laughs> okay. The other um, myth that is huge, and I have to say, thank God, like, you know, I Uncle Tim is finally getting credit for this far and wide outside of gymnastic circles. And this was even credited in a BBC article recently. Um, so the Sydney vault myth, the myth that a mistake happened because the vault was set at the wrong height at the Sydney Olympics. And we remember watching all those gymnasts crash in Sydney. And then finally, um, Slater spoke up and they raised the vault because it was at the wrong height. So the, the myth is that it was at the wrong height. So that's true and false at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the theory that Dr. Uncle Tim discovered, which is probably 100% true, is that the vault was set exactly correct according to the apparatus norms. And he went back and has the pictures and the receipts, receipts, you guys, on his website, gymnastics-history.com, um, which shows exactly how the mistake was made. So basically, in 98, the vault height was raised from 120 centimeters, easy to say, centimeters, 10 centimeters, it's fine, raised from 120 centimeters to 125 centimeters. The 2000 apparatus norms got printed, but they were printed wrong, you guys. The printed document was wrong. And remember, this was before email was super, super common and everything was electronic. Like 2000 was still your first using the internet days. Like you didn't do if everything you were at school. Using the yeah. Well, I, no, I mean, everyone used the internet, <laughs> but it wasn't like every single paper you turned in at school or everything you did at work was 100% electronic. Like the paper was still the, the modus operandi generally. Okay. Yeah. I'm older than you, so I remember anyway. what it was like in 2000. Yeah. Anyway. Um. Okay. <laughs> so then what anyway, happened? It's not an excuse. There's, this, is not an, this is not an effective excuse. They printed the wrong apparatus norms and then had to issue a correction to the apparatus norms. But at the 2000 Olympics, uh, they set up, they had the, the original printing of the apparatus norms, not the corrected version. Yeah, so they set them exactly with the documents that they had. So the truth was the is, vault set wrong. Yes, did they make a mistake in setting it up based on what they were given? No, right. That's the truth. And I think this is always the lesson of you know, even when I go to websites these days, I always look. When was this printed? Is this still current? Like, is there an update to it? And I think back in the day, it was like if you you know, and having been a professional legal researcher for, researcher for 18 years, part of the thing was you look at what the law is and then you see if there's an update. And then if the update isn't in the back of the book, then you check online to see if there's an update and you have to make sure you've checked for an update 50 million times. So is this an excuse for what happened? No, I still blame every single coach who didn't measure the vault and let their gymnast compete on the wrong height. And I really appreciate when I see coaches now measuring the shit out of every apparatus <laughs> forward side tension the height checking everything like honestly because the real thing is the gymnast safety is in your hands and so you need to check everything so let that be a lesson some people just like to give us no strings attached money they don't want to bother with joining club gym nerd and so they just donate you can find our donate button for a no strings attached donation at the bottom of the club page at gymcastic.com forward slash club. The other huge gigantic myth mm -hmm. busted. So do you remember how we all watch Gymnastics Greatest Stars? And it's the greatest, yes. still you should get it and watch it because it's still the greatest gymnastics history VHS tape, which you can find on YouTube now of all time. True mm -hmm. or false? Did you watch it on VHS? 
No, I've only seen it on YouTube later. Okay. You know, I didn't know about really, I wasn't like a gymnastics dork until adulthood. Yeah, that's true. You uh, weren't indoctrinated until just the right time. Okay, so the myth of the Mexico Olympic Games in gymnastics, the myth is that those commies cheated and changed the scores so the Soviets would win. That's the myth. Mm -hmm. As propagated by U.S. propaganda, uh, because that was the height of Cold War. And, and we <laughs> Including were... this podcast, we should say, because we definitely <laughs> told this story like 500 times that they changed the scores so that Cheslavska of the Czech, Czechoslovakia and Petrik of the Soviet Union uh, would tie... And then, you know, Cheslavska could protest this corruption, protest the war, all still valid, the invasion protest, all yes. wonderful, and we Hero. love them. But um, turns out, the as far as we can tell, the adjustment of the score so that Cheslavska and Petrik would tie was a correct was, the, was the correct thing because the prelim scores had been printed incorrectly. So this right. idea that they changed her score, they did not change Patrick's score. They corrected Patrick's score to what it should have been because the prelim scores had been printed incorrectly. Yep. So the, the stopping the competition was, hey, wait a minute. These scores are wrong. They're actually tied. That's not the right... Because back then the scores carried over. So... They had to show, okay, the, the actual scores you have today is wrong. Here's what she was actually given. Okay, so they should tie. So that's a huge deal, too. And I mean, imagine if they were truncating at the same time. It could have been even worse. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, and one of the things that um, Uncle Tim found at gymnastics-history.com this is a commercial for his website and you guys should go there all the mm -hmm. time, um, is that he found a news story from that time in the archives that explained exactly what happened. So it's not like this story wasn't out there. It just took someone like him to actually, who's actually trained as an archivist and a historian to do the research and find it. Um, and it just goes to show how anyone can be a victim of propaganda, even if you're staunchly against it and think that you haven't been indoctrinated. It can happen to you. Is that the lesson you took away? That's the lesson I took away from this adventure. No, that's not the lesson I took away. <laughs> the lesson I took away was don't print the scores incorrectly. <laughs> have You know what they need to have? Like uh, newspapers have the fact checker and the copy editor. You oh, need a numbers so copy editor. You think newspapers still have fact checkers and copy editors. <laughs> This is why you guys should pay for they, your local news. They got with fired us. in 2001 when Nellie Kim removed all the schools for the code of points. <laughs> yeah, support your local media, starting with us, obviously, your niche favorite gymnastics podcast, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. your local newspaper. Okay, so the, I, the, the next myth mm -hmm. is the one that I am most interested to see if will actually be corrected in the bigger culture outside of gymnastics. I think most gymnastics fans know this now, but are we going to get to the next Olympic games and find out or the next world championships and discover that uh, this, this fact is actually fixed and the way people talk about it is corrected. So the myth is Simone Biles is the most decorated gymnast of all time. The truth is Spencer. Yeah. So, his, like, officially, I guess, in the records, we think of Simone Biles and Larissa Latina have, as being tied on 32 combined World and Olympic medals apiece. Simone with way more world medals, because now they do worlds every year instead of once every four years. 25 world medals, 7 Olympic medals, putting her on 32. Larissa Latina, 18 world medals. Uh, 14 Olympic medals, putting her on 32. Turns out she had Larissa Latinina also had an uncounted medal from the 1954 World Championships in the Team Portable Apparatus event, which was basically the precursor to Rhythmic. 
So it was a separate team competition from the team fixed apparatus medal, which is the team, like the team final that we know today. There was another uh, team medal that she won in 1954 that has not been included in her total. So Latina should be on 33 medals and Simone should be on 32 total combined world and Olympic medals. So the truth is Latinida was not credited with a world medal. And in fact, she has one more world medal than Simone Biles, which puts Latinida at 33. And I think this is why it's one of the important things to think about when you're looking at the historic documents and how the medals were counted. We just had this happen in NCAA too, is that there things will change. They will had more events they competed in back in the day, just like men had more events too, because they had freaking rope climbing where you sit on the ground. That's how you start. And you climb a rope and that, cause you know, you think about all this stuff was based on military uh, exercise and that's how it's, how the, the competition sport of gymnastics started in the Western world. So, um, you have to count things that maybe people don't have an opportunity to. And if you, and some people might think, well, this isn't fair because like, that's not even an event that like people do. But the, the truth of it is it was more work. They had more stuff to do. And Simone has had more world championships to compete in. Whereas Latina had to wait. So in, if you think about it that way, she might've had more events to compete in, but the actual, uh, opportunities to get a medal were way less than what Simone has had. And she competed five months pregnant. So that's the other impressive feat that she accomplished. So we were just watching a little bit of video of rope climb and I have to tell a story about this. So we, um, mm-hmm. we so I used to put on adult gymnastics meets, adult gymnastics, another, if you want proof that uh, you could still do gymnastics after high school or whenever you stopped, go to an adult gymnastics meet, you will enjoy it so much or go to an adult gymnastics class. It's amazing. So I used to put on these meets and there was these guys who were in their eighties who showed up to compete in rope climb. And we added rope climb because people said they wanted it. They showed up in their old NCAA men's costumes. Their were, you know, their outfits that they wore costumes, <laughs> costumes from the olden days, you know, with suspenders, the whole deal. And they competed in rope climb. These guys were, so starting sitting down at 80 year old men sitting on the floor, um, they were beating the 20 year olds in the rope climb. So you have to climb all the way without using your legs. You have to touch the top. There's like a bell chalk thing at the top. It's like a metal thing. It looks like the things that you put on ropes to keep squirrels from climbing on them. It's one of those, but for humans. So you tap it and then you come down and they were beating the 20 year olds, these 80 year old dudes. And one of them was like, you know, the NCAA champion from however many years that was ago. It was amazing to see. So it also means that just because the, the event doesn't exist anymore, doesn't it mean it's not badass and wasn't hard to do. And anything where you have to involve a bunch of team members, oh, a thousand times harder than working by yourself. <laughs> Let's be honest. The most important skill in life, working with other people because it's freaking hard. So, yeah. Do Also, so I think what I was yeah. saying before, I think I said Latina, I inverted which number was Worlds and Olympic medals. Latina has 18 Olympic medals and officially 15. 14 Worlds medals, but actually 15 Worlds medals. I think I inverted which one was Worlds and Olympics. So what I'm saying is don't send us any emails because I know. Yeah, 15 <laughs> World medals because the she had 14 officially credited. The 15th is what... Uh, was the event that doesn't exist anymore that Uncle Tim found she was not credited with. Like we just had this happen in NCAs where we uh, thought that Hope Spivey only had, the, looking at the 10 y- record, we mm-hmm. thought that Hope Spivey only had 20 something. She had 27. Because people weren't counting 10s in the postseason. So she had gotten 10s at NCAA championships that weren't counted. And so the number, the total number was actually wrong. So mm-hmm. qualifiers important. Uh, so do you think, so let's just say maybe perhaps Simone Biles comes back to competition that she's not just working yeah. out for fun. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the rights holders who are broadcasting these, her competitions around the world will start with, well, it's no wonder she came back because it turns out she has one more world or Olympic medal to win in order to tie Larissa Latinina. <laughs> no, they will not. They will not do that. 
What about the BBC broadcast? Well, I don't know. Foreign broadcasts that aren't American. What about the Soviet broad Soviet? Sorry, the Ru- Soviets can't. <laughs> the Russian broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Will they broadcast if they're, you know, the Russian team is not allowed to compete? I feel like they'll just be like, this is not an event. Will they take credit for the people that like defected and then are competing still? I don't know. Well, time will time will tell. No, they'll pretend like it's not but No, I don't think that's going to be a big deal because already like even b- generally, I think the assumption is that Sh- Biles and Latina are tied. So that would be their storyline anyway. Like she needs just one more medal, even though she actually needs two to set the record uh, herself. Isn't there enough? I mean, the Olymp, this should be, this is the thing. Who's the official record holder? Obviously it's us, but is it the FIG? Is it the Olympic, the IOC who holds these records? Is it uh, an independent body like the Guinness Book of World Records? Do we trust the Guinness? Should we be an independent body? The independent I, we are. It's a record keeping body. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should. I think we'll, we should start that. And yeah. Up next, our official. And then we can have awards. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica already has gone to, a, immediately goes to awards show. You guys, see how excited I am about awards. I want them all to look like, what was that Euros where it was just like a hand? Like it was just a fist in a rock. But it was actually supposed to be like a, a ring, someone holding a, a ring mm. pommel. Is it a pommel when it's on a ring or is it a ring? It's a ring. <laughs> <laughs> there is that one of someone holding like just a partial ring and it looks like they're holding like a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> Curvy hot dog. That's the one. Yeah. Oh, that's my favorite one. It looks like they <laughs> cast someone ha- someone's hand in like carbonite like they do in Star Wars. It looks like, you know, they anyway. I enjoy that one very much because it just looks like extremely heavy rock, heavy rock that you could beat someone with if you needed to. And that's the other thing. Also, can you guys, it's when we're speaking of awards, don't bite the bronze or silver medal, you guys. It's gold that is malleable that you're supposed to be able to bite it to see that if it's real gold, not silver or bronze. Oh, did these... Did they, these kids not grow up in a, a state that had the, the gold rush? This is a basic gold fact. How, how does everyone... Not, I'm so embarrassed for them when they bite the silver medal. I'm like, oh, dear. It's no longer to check to see if you're leaving tooth marks. It's because it's a pose. I'm waiting for the, the nerd who's like, I'm not doing that because that's not a thing. Well, then, wait for Steven Nedarosik to win a silver or bronze medal at a <laughs> world championships because I feel like he would do that. He'd be also, like, actually, that's I know not, they're not, not right. <laughs> I know they're not really like biting, biting, biting. They just pretend to bite it. But also, these have like electronics in them now. You can't be biting into things with electricity in them. You know, like they had the glow light up ones in Stuttgart. And then what are the, there's another one that we just had like a spinny thing in it. Was that Euros? I do want to mention that we, there are other myths that we've busted in our other three episodes. And there are more details about some of the other things we didn't get into. Like we have the, you know, that did the tampon fall out during a routine story. And we have some of the broken apparatus stories over the years and all that kind of stuff. So important other myths are busted in those episodes. So if you want more details on those, uh, please visit those three episodes. They will be in the show notes, or you can look up Mythbusters on our website or any of the Gymcastic um, podcasts in the past, and you will find those. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, and if you're not already listening, you don't have us, you're not subscribing in your favorite podcast player, please do so. I like Stitcher because it automatically downloads the episodes for you. So when I get on a plane, I don't have to remember to download things. Um, And remember, we have Behind the Scenes coming up every Friday. So we'll see you this Friday at noon Pacific on Behind the Scenes for Club Gym Nerd members. And you can ask us questions live, or you can ask us questions about this very episode and be like, why didn't you talk about XYZ? Then we can give you the real story on Behind the Scenes. So we'll see you at noon Pacific this Friday. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you on Behind the Scenes. 
Until then, take up on gay, split on rights, and we'll see you on Friday. Thanks for listening. This show is created, executive produced, produced, edited, audio engineered, and published by me, Jessica O'Byrne. Managing editor in charge of show notes, podcast content, and wrangling over enthusiasm is Spencer Barnes. Our news editor is Uncle Tim of gymnasticshyphenhistory.com. And customer service IT, Gymternet News, and additional production services are provided by Steve Cooper, a.k.a. Fact Check.